as central banks continue to tighten, somebody will blow up. And that domino will knock down a bunch of other dominoes um, until the market psychology completely changes from, you know, blasé, um, mid-range optimism by the debt or by the dip, like it prevails in a lot of places right now, to blind panic. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. When at the start of a new year as we are right now, it helps to take a fresh look at the macro situation, the key trends that will drive the economy and markets from here. For example, the mountain of global debt continues to expand, but the cost of servicing it is suddenly skyrocketing due to higher interest rates. And inflation, while starting to moderate, is still not anywhere under control. The U.S. money supply is now shrinking for the first time in at least 60 years, and the rest of the world is rushing to find ways to de-dollarize trade. What impact will these trends have for investors in 2023? To discuss, we're fortunate to be joined today by John Rubino, co-author of the book, The Money Bubble. John, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Adam, good to talk to you again. And congratulations on the big 2022 you had. You know, you've got a, a ton of new subscribers out here. Uh, it was a great year for Wealthion in no small part, John, because we had wonderful guests like John Rubino on the program. <laughs> All right. Well, look, John, as we dive in here, uh, I'm glad we get you right after teaching your graduate level course in advanced organic chemistry. Uh, but now we're going <laughs> to we're, we're going to trundle over into macroeconomics, if that's OK. Well, Adam, that I, I put that background up in honor of you and in honor of gold and silver, because that's what we're, we're going to talk about today in part. So you can see the AU and the AG probably over my left shoulder. Yeah, very. Uh, uh, I like yeah. how you do that. Okay, All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, yes, we will definitely get there. We're going to take a bit of a journey first uh, on the macro mm -hmm. side of things, which I think will set up the story you want to tell about the precious metals. Um, so, a lot of questions for you, John, to prepare you. I've got a lot of charts and data I'm going to put up through the conversation here. But just to kick things off, um, let me ask the question I always ask at the start of these conversations: What is your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Uh, it's bad on at least two levels. Uh, the, the first level is, um, you know, the year ahead. Are we going to have a recession or not? And it looks like we definitely are for, for a few reasons. Here, here's some of the major high points that lead to a, um, a, a slowing economy in the next year. Um, consumers are totally tapped out. Um, credit card debt um, is at a record level, and the savings rate has gone down to about zero right now, which means uh, people just aren't going to be able to spend in the year ahead the way they spent in 2022 because they used up all their borrowing power then, you know, so that that inevitably leads to a slowing economy. Uh, meanwhile, M the M2 money supply is shrinking, which it hardly ever does. You know, the uh, the stock market and the economy usually track M2 pretty closely. Um, and if that continues, that means shrinking economy in the year ahead and probably falling stock prices. Um, housing is rolling over and stocks and bonds lost um, about $16 trillion between them globally in, in the past year, which means we've got a, a wealth effect in reverse coming where, um, you know, when, when your stocks are up or your bonds are up, you feel smart, uh, you feel rich, you want to go out and buy things. The reverse is true when those things go down. And that's what happened in the last year. A lot of people feel dumber and poorer than they did at the beginning of 2022. So um, that's liable to lead to, uh, again, lower consumer spending and a slowing economy. So we almost certainly have a recession in the coming year. Um, but that's not really the big story at all. The big story is that the underlying problems have not been fixed in any way, shape or form. You know, we're still running um, a structural deficit in the U.S. of a trillion dollars a year. In other words, we're taking on huge amounts of new debt continuously. Um, and that's not going to go away because baby boomers are retiring. You know, we we want our Medicare and our Social Security now. And you're not going to be able to take it away from us, which means the government is going to have to spend more and more year after year, and they're just going to borrow the money. So deficit deficit is going to grow. At the same time, interest rates are higher, which means all of our government debt has to be rolled over at higher and higher rates, which means higher and higher interest expense. So you put those two things together and you know, we're going to be adding a couple of trillion dollars a year to the debt 
And it, it's going to be kind of a death spiral where we pay more and more interest on the debt that we're taking on, which leads us to take on even more debt. Uh, and it's not clear how we get out of that. You know, that is something that uh, could basically end the financial system as we know it and in the not too distant future. So, so yeah, um, in, in general, I'm not optimistic about uh, the near ter term or the, um, the intermediate term for the U.S. and the rest of the world. Okay. Um, it's amazing how many of my charts you just uh, <laughs> tied into with your <laughs> answer there. So um, let's dive in here. Um, how to tackle this. Why don't, why don't we start with money supply? So um, as measured by M2 here in the US, um, I'll put up a chart here that's showing what we're talking about here. Um, but the money supply after skyrocketing, you know, in, in the wake of the pandemic um, is now actually shrinking for the first time in this data set, which goes back uh, to the late 50s, right? So really it's something that we have not seen before uh, as Americans, um, at least adult Americans, um, where we're seeing the actual pool of money start to, to shrink and who knows how long lived that'll be. Um, but you wrote a book, John, you know, called The Money Bubble. Um, how material is this shifting into reverse right now in terms of the growth of, of, of M2? Well, it's, it's potentially huge because so much leverage has been built, built up in so many different sectors of the global economy because money was so easy for such a long time. In other words, we, we were flooding the system with new cash and new credit year after year after year. And that made a lot of things possible that uh, probably shouldn't have been possible. You know, you look at SPACs and NFTs and most of the rest of the crypto space and big tech and, you know, government bonds. How did Italy take on the amount of debt that it took on only because there was so much money sloshing around in the, the global financial system? So all those guys and many, many other over leveraged financial entities out there uh, can only survive if um, new money is handed to them year after year after year. And that's changed now. All of a sudden, the amount of money in the system is shrinking, which means, um, at, you know, as Warren Buffett says, it's only when the tide goes out that you find out who's been swimming naked. Well, the everything bubble um, or the money bubble, as, as James Turk and I titled our book, um, that that's a place where thousands and thousands, if not millions of, of financial entities have been swimming naked. In other words, they, they can't function without tons of new money coming in. And they're going to be exposed as bad business models, as frauds, as all kinds of things that uh, lead to bankruptcy in the next few years. So we're going to see all kinds of um, um, banks, hedge funds, and potentially governments um, implode because there isn't enough money to keep them going. And, uh, you know, I would start with maybe Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank um, and go from there because they're the uh, the kind of the poster children for this over leveraged financial entity that needs new money to survive and is not going to get it in the year ahead and what's going to happen. Uh, but uh, there, there's so many more like that. And um, that's what I think will be one of the big stories going forward is, oh, who went bankrupt today <laughs> you know? and who's next? And uh, that's a terrible environment for risk assets. In other words, if you're buying something like Amazon stock, which kind of depends on the world improving or at least being stable going forward, um, then it's not that kind of world anymore. So that, that asset is going to be repriced at a much lower level. And you're going to lose a lot of money. So if you made your bets on margin, then you're one of the guys who uh, who was swimming naked. And uh, you know, as I keep repeating, there's a lot of people like that out there in this world. Okay, so um, liquidity was plentiful and cheap. Um, that allowed for a lot of um, asset bubbles to to get created for malinvestment to, to happen. Now that you're saying that it's becoming less available and more expensive. Um, you run the risk of sending the weaker players, at least initially first, you know, into some sort of cardiac arrest, and then that could maybe, you know, cascade further in, um, maybe in sort of some some way like we saw back in the 2008 global financial crisis here. Um, Adam, so, except, except much bigger. The numbers have doubled since then. So the crises will be commensurately scarier. Yeah. Well, the numbers have doubled or in the case of... Um, 
uh, debt, uh, the debt pile actually, I think, is more like uh, tripled. Um, I, I'm doing this from memory now, but I think in the U.S. at least, federal debt was like around nine trillion in 2008. It's now 31 trillion. All right. So that, yeah. that's, that's more than a tripling, actually. Yeah. Well, total debt in the U.S. Um, didn't triple because consumers um, they, they're taking on a lot of money lately, but they they retrenched for a while, and the housing market. Um, lost a lot of debt and has been rebuilding it, but hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't really doubled. So, so when you balance it all out, uh, you probably get some kind of a global doubling of debt, which, okay. which is terrible. You which know, that's, is still, that's I mean, we're talking about what, yeah, thing. fourteen yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, terrible. yeah, yeah. You know, so, so such a big piece of the debt that's been created in all of human history happened in the last twenty years, uh, and there's, you know, there's no way to fix that and maintain stable prices out there you know keep from keep the currencies of the world from collapsing uh so we're, we're in a box right now where whatever we do whatever the central banks and the governments of the world do they risk a gigantic crisis of one kind or another and so it's just a question of choosing now they got to you know make their choices decide which one of which crisis they're going to risk and then go for it. And so far, they're uh, they're tightening. So they're they're risking the deflationary depression risk. Um, and you know, uh, another year like last year in terms of monetary tightening, we could be there. You know, that it could happen. All right. And, and, and the reason why I'm sort of diving into this is because the 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 debt part of the story is such an important one, right? And um, and and real quick, I I, I want to dial into some charts around you know, the stats around on the way things are with debt and then with the rising interest payments on the debt. Um, but real quick, can you just make the link for us between money, especially fiat currency and debt? So we have a debt-based money system in most major, uh, well, probably I think in all, you know, world economies these days. Um, for the viewer that doesn't exactly understand that the way that somebody as experienced as you do, John, can you just give the 60 second description of what that means? Well, in a, in a fiat currency fractional reserve banking system, uh, credit can be created in basically unlimited quantities by the banking system as long as the government helps by um, by creating a lot of new currency and giving it to the big banks. So what we've seen in the last few years or, or last few decades, actually, is the big banks, you know, taking newly created money from or newly created currency from governments and then lending out massive multiples of that money or um, hedge funds doing similar things or big corporations doing similar things. But every financial entity out there is creating new credits using the base money that the uh, central banks are creating. And in good times, when you know there's um, a steady stream of new money coming into the system, it becomes kind of a Ponzi scheme where you can uh, you can create unlimited amounts of credit and uh, and get away with it. And that's what we've seen really since the 1990s when the Federal Reserve started bailing out everybody in sight and uh, and basically telling the banking system, "Go ahead and take any risk you want. You know, we're, we've got your back." Yeah. Um, so we've seen. Um, the creation of amounts of credit that are totally unprecedented in human history. You know, we've never seen debt grow like this before. Um, and, you know, like any other kind of debt binge, the, um, the central bank fractional reserve banking debt binge um, has a time limit. You know, you can only borrow so much before it blows up on you. And that's the big question. You know, when, when does the, uh, the Ponzi scheme run out of new cash with with which to pay out its existing customers and bring in new customers and you know i'd argue that we're pretty close but uh, you can't know the timing of these things for sure but uh, 2023 is going to be kind of a decision decision point where we have to decide whether this system um in which central banks basically just let fly just create as much new money as it takes to bail out everybody in sight uh, whether that system can continue Great. And that is the, I think, the key question that 2023 revolves around and that I want this discussion to revolve around. So um, up until now, you've been saying um, money has been plentiful and cheap. Uh, that has enabled credit to be plentiful and cheap. Um, now we have the money supply, at least in the U.S., now starting to shrink. Um, we have the Federal Reserve tightening. 
right? It's no longer buying all those treasury bonds and mortgage bonds that it was it was buying beforehand. Uh, it's now making the cost of debt more expensive. So, you know, it, it's kind of a game changer. And as you're saying, John, we're going to find out relatively soon if, if the Fed is and other world central banks are going to continue to be able to embrace this policy or if something's going to force them to have to go back in the other direction. Um, so let me just put up some stats here real quick. First, here is a chart of the outstanding uh, U.S. Treasury debt. Um, we can see, you know, how much it's grown over the past several decades here. Uh, certainly took off uh, after the the 2008 global financial crisis. Um, we're now up. Uh, uh, actually, this chart, I'm sorry, is a chart of uh, debt to GDP, um, right? Which is basically just showing that we are growing our debts at a way faster rate um, than we are our underlying income. And you know, anybody who runs a household knows. Uh, you can't do that for very long. Now, a, a, a sovereign government can do it for longer because they have a printing press, uh, but they can't do it forever. But you can see here that you know things have gotten um, much more accelerated as we've we've gone in this past uh, decade here. Um, uh, I also now want to put up this chart though, which is public debt outstanding per capita, and I think this really hits home um, that this has been growing exponentially since the the late seventies, and you know in the past couple of years. Uh, it's just gone on fire. And I was sort of looking at this chart and realizing that um, in just the past 10 years, the uh, amount of debt for, per person working in the labor force um, has doubled, right? So um, you really see it when you look at it at a per capita basis, because uh, yes, the population's growing, but the debt is just growing way faster uh, than our workers, the workers that we're creating to <laughs> to work it off here. So you know the the, the debt pile just continues to be massive. Is is my main point here? Um, I want to combine that now with something you mentioned in in your first answer, John, which is um, with the uh, rate hikes that the Fed and the other major central banks, uh, most of the major other central banks, have been doing. The cost of servicing that debt is really beginning to take off here. And much more of, you mentioned, we're already still, you know, deficit spending, uh, you know, in the trillions in this country. Um, more and more of that spending is going to have to just go to servicing the debt instead of other government policies going forward. So here's a quote, uh, the Congressional Budget Office projected that annual interest costs on U.S. federal debt would total uh, almost 400 billion in 2022, and nearly triple over the coming decade, soaring from uh, 442 billion to 1.2 <coughs> trillion. Um, here is a chart showing that as the federal funds rate is getting raised by the Fed, um, that the interest rate on uh, the three-month U.S. Treasury bill uh, has shot the moon. I mean, literally from you know uh, almost zero uh, back in end of 2021. Uh, to now, you know, around 4%, right, and, and going higher from here. Um, so, of course, the big question is, is um, what is that doing to the debt pile? And I just want to put up a couple of chat charts here, and, and I'm going to let you run, John. Um, so here's a chart uh, based on the end of 2020. This was the most recent chart I could find, but it shows uh, Treasury notes as represented by um, uh, their durations here. Um, and you'll see that that uh, of that whole portfolio, treasury bills, which are one year or less, are about a quarter. Notes, which are one to 10 year, are over half. Um, and so a fair amount of this debt, you know, is going to come uh, up for renewal um, either within the next year or within the next 10 years. And this stat from Econofact says that $7 trillion alone of that debt, of the, of the U.S. federal debt, um, will need to be refinanced just in 2023 alone. Um, so what I could tell here from uh, from their article here is it says um, the current maturity structure of, of the outstanding uh, federal debt is such that most of the current debt will mature within the next three years, 30% um, of which uh, is going to be uh, happening in 2023, as I just mentioned. So, um, you know, a huge chunk of this debt is going to re-rate at these higher interest prices, right? So it's sort of like we're, we're, we're seeing this coming tsunami, this coming tidal wave of much higher interest costs coming in on the national debt. And that's gonna dramatically limit our ability to what we can fund as a nation. How concerned are you about this? Oh, it's uh, it's a potential catastrophe because um, yeah, um, 
the actually the number I saw for um, um, federal debt expense for interest expense was was somewhat higher than you mentioned. I saw a number of like seven hundred billion already, and just lately. And so wh whichever number is right, it's still a really big number for the the government to just be paying out without actually getting anything for it. You know, interest expense is uh, is not productive spending. So yeah, we're going to see that spike. So let's say that goes to a trillion dollars um, in the next couple of years, which I great. I think... it's, it's sorry to interrupt, John. As you're answering, I'm just going to put up a chart here from the okay. the, the Peterson Foundation showing uh, actual net interest on the debt, and then projections out through 2032. And, and okay. just so you know what it is, it's it's from around 400 million right now by their calculation. Uh, it's up to 1.2 trillion by 2032. So it's just this, you know. Hockey stick ramp, hockey stick ramp up into the right. Yeah, 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 and and that's in addition to all the other stuff that we're recklessly spending on. So here, here's um, the death spiral scenario that flows from this. Um, the the U.S. government keeps on spending way beyond its means, uh, and a lot of that becomes interest costs, which for which we don't get anything. Um, and that spooks the financial markets because it's clear that there's no end in sight to that. That causes people to sell the dollar, which um, forces the government to spend even more un until you, you get this runaway inflation where um, nobody wants to hold on to the currency of a country who's running up debts at an accelerating rate. And, uh, and you know, that, that will break pretty much any currency. The dollar is, of course, the world's reserve currency. And we can keep on going longer than, say, um, um, Great Britain could do, or China, or certainly Italy or France. Uh, but there's a limit to till the till till to anybody's ability to overspend and overborrow and create currency at an accelerating rate, and and uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, will eventually lead the dollar into some kind of a, you know, a, 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 instead of an orderly decline, like we've had since 1971, a disorderly decline where it just gaps down and not in terms of other currencies, but in terms of purchasing power. In other words, inflation starts to really spike. And the only solution for rising inflation, as we found just lately here, is higher interest rates. But in the current system, higher interest rates means higher interest costs, which means bigger deficits, which means a weaker currency, which means higher inflation. So you can't fix this once it gets going. And the question is, are, are we at that point now? You know, are, are we at the point where we cannot fix it? Because whatever we do to fix the first problem exacerbates the second problem, mm. which feeds back into the first problem. And, um, you know, I, I think that there, there's a decent chance that we're close to that point right now. Um, and it just requires people to recognize it. Um, there's a thing in the, the Austrian School of Economics called the crack-up boom, which occurs when a critical mass of people realize that it's the explicit policy of the government to just continue to devalue the currency. And then people start acting accordingly. They dump the currency and buy real stuff. And um, that causes the currency just to collapse, not because of an immediate oversupply, but because of a loss of confidence. Uh, and what we're heading into right now is the kind of circumstance that can lead to something like that. So we're we're really playing with fire, but we don't have any kind of a solution. You know, there, there's no way to get out of this now that we're in it. So uh, that's why I think 2023 is going to be a, an amazing year because we have to make the decisions that year. You know, if we're going to keep raising interest rates to head off inflation in the face of a recession, um, then that's going to cause interest costs to spiral all over the global economy and start blowing people up. And, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. Uh, and if we don't, you know, if we cut interest rates again, then we're liable to reignite inflation and uh, and start the whole thing over again. So uh, I, I do think there is no easy way out of this, certainly no pain-free way out of this. And instead of, you know, this reckoning being five years from now or 10 years from now, it, it could be easily this year, you know? This is when we find out uh, what all of the stuff that we've been doing in the past 30 years leads to. Yeah, and that is the, is the crazy part about this. You and I were talking about this before we turned the, the cameras on, is, is we can assess when the risk level is growing, 
um, it's much harder and in a complex system like this one, probably impossible to determine the exact trigger or the exact timing. Um, but you can you can measure the the general risk level increasing. And so therefore, you know, we have to be prepared for stuff that that maybe we thought, yeah, that might be coming down the road at some point. We have to be more and more prepared that, well, it could actually happen tomorrow. Um, it, in a certain, I'm not saying it's going to, but the, the possibility of of some of this stuff that we've you and I have been talking about for years potentially happening, John. Um, it now seems to have a non-zero risk of happening sooner. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, so so the upshot is that we should all be really risk averse heading into this because you cannot know um, the details of something like this because so much of it depends on um, people operating with bad economic models sitting around a conference table and and making decisions under exter extreme pressure you know so you can't know how the central banks of the world and the governments of the world are going to respond to all of this uh, except that they're probably going to make big mistakes um, right. because there there's really nothing left for them to do that can't be characterized as a big mistake in retrospect um so you know they're going to do stuff that makes the situation worse. You just don't know what specific things they're going to do. So you should be very careful with your money, you know. And that and that means um, even if something happens next year to make tech stocks go back up for a while, for instance, if the Fed capitulates and starts lowering interest rates, then some of these um, the winners of previous years might go back up. But um, at a risk return calculus that is still probably unacceptable. So you, you don't want to pile back into high risk equities or junk bonds or things like that, just because um, so many bad things can happen out there. So th this is really a time, if you're not already doing it, to be shifting your, uh, your finances away from financial assets like bonds and tech stocks and into real assets like energy stocks and farmland and rental houses and gold and silver, things that governments can't just blow up by uh, by creating too many of them on, uh, on an electronic printing press. Um, all right. So think of those things as insurance, which we all should be loading up on going forward. I totally agree. And I want to, I want to dive uh specifically in insurance with you in, in, in a little bit. And I, and, and I do want to really dive into you on, on your, you know, your outlook for investors and clearly this uh, getting the message loud and clear from you, you know, get more into to real things, tangible things, things whose um, value can't be inflated away by whatever happens to the currency. Um, but, I, but I do want to go through a, a bit more of the macro rump before we get there. Um, just picking on a couple of threads that you've you've laid out here for us. Um, so it, it sort of sounds like from what you're saying, John, is that to a certain extent, world leaders are, are really just playing for time at this point. Um, they're, they're kind of a damned if they do, damned if they don't at, at this stage, if I, if I can kind of condense sort of the problem, you know, the, the box that you, you described them being in. Um, you know, it, it's so hard for us oftentimes, uh, us Americans, to um, you know realize that that this is a world that um, exists, you know, far beyond our shores. In the sense that you know we can do some, we we can have our own strategy here, but we can be impacted uh, by other developments that happen elsewhere around the world. Um, we just think of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. We think of ourselves as the world's biggest economy, um, but but we can be very impacted um, by things that happen offshore and and there's some big things happening i want to talk to you about in just a second um but uh but let's stay in the us just for a moment here um so uh i'm curious and i know you don't have a crystal ball john but um what do you think is more likely here um you know that pal delivers upon what he says he's going to do i'm going to keep keep hiking probably up until around 5% or so in the fed funds rate we're then going to hold it there for a prolonged period of time because there's a delayed impact for all our policy, you know, steps that we've taken so far, all those rate hikes that they've made through 2020. We still haven't really felt very many of those in full force yet. They want to wait and see what happens and then basically call an audible later on in the year. Um, there's That's path number one. Uh, path number two is that um, something breaks. Uh, and it forces the Fed uh, to have to to ease just because there's some 
major crisis that it just can't ignore, right? Maybe a, a freezing up in the credit markets or banks start failing or whatever it is, right? But there's a, and there's a lot of people that think that that's probably what's going to happen here. Um, and then then there's more of what you were saying earlier, John, about like, um, uh, you know, if, if we continue strengthening the dollar here at this point in time, um, you know, it, it could really start a, a killing a lot of our allies um, who are getting crushed under a strong dollar policy. Um, but also just just as we talked about earlier, just the interest service costs just get so dang high for us that we just might not be able to sustain that. So do you have a sense of which of those three you think is more likely here? Well, I think, you know, at a certain point, they're all the same scenario. The The Fed feels obligated to raise interest rates because, you know, we had 8% official inflation in the U.S. last year. That's, that is catastrophic from right. the point of view of a central bank with a 2% in, um, inflation target. Um, so the, the Fed has to raise interest rates to the point that it breaks something. So that's that's what they'll do. I mean, they, they will stay tight until the um, till the economy shows signs of uh, of inflation ending. And for that to happen, you got to have a downturn. And for there to be a downturn, some of these over leveraged entities have to blow up. Um, so the Fed will raise interest rates, or or at least keep them high and stable until something breaks, um, at which point they'll panic and they'll go back to cutting interest rates um, with all the, uh, you know, the, the inflationary and instability implications that uh, that flow with that. Um, and then we'll see what happens, you know? So I, I, um, I don't think we can keep doing this much longer for the reasons we've already talked about, you know, so, so many over leveraged entities have to roll over their debt at higher and higher interest rates, and that's going to blow up the finances. So, you know, the U.S. has to do that, like we talked about, but we're in much better shape than a lot of other governments. Um, so it won't necessarily be the U.S., even though we're we're looking at a trillion dollars a year of um, interest expense, it, it, it won't be us that is the... Um, the entity that goes into a crisis because of that, it'll be some other country, you know, Japan, my God, if Japan goes mm -hmm. uh, to 2% interest on their debt, they're a bankrupt government. Um, and Europe is a total mess. China is heading into some kind of a financial crisis, but they're so opaque, we don't really know exactly what kind. Um, and, you know, look around the rest of the world, you find other examples of things like that. So um, as central banks continue to tighten, somebody will blow up and that domino will knock down a bunch of other dominoes um, until the market psychology completely changes from you know blase um mid-range optimism by the debt or by the dip like it prevails in a lot of places right now to blind panic and when that happens central banks have no choice but to ease again so you know we could easily be looking at by the end of this year um, massive cuts in interest rates and some places going back to negative interest rates um, just because things get so bad in the financial economy. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think there are lots of different ways that we can get there, but those scenarios are all compressed into six months, let's say. And at the end of six months, we're liable to be at the end game for all of those scenarios. And it's gonna look very similar across the board. It's gonna be um, financial entities blowing up because they're too they're over leveraged. Um, central banks and governments starting to panic. And a lot of the monetary tightening that's been put in place in the last year being reversed out, you know? And um, that's, you know, that's a, a portrait of a moribund society you know we, we we can't do that and still survive in our present form so it could be that that's the end of the whole fiat currency regime you know it, it could be that this is sooner rather than way off in the distant future where um you know you see china and um and russia right now loading up on gold and india go loading up on silver with the apparent intent to buy back their currencies with precious metals um so we may be at a stage a year from now where that's 
you know, that's not some kind of a fringe idea. That that's something that's in the mix of consensus discussion. Going back to backing our currencies with something that will stabilize them, like gold, and uh, you know, it could be a commodity-based thing eventually, like oil or something like that. But um, we'll recognize the need to take the printing presses away from the governments of the world, and we'll we'll do that by stabilizing our currencies in some way. Uh, and I know that sounds crazy right now because fiat currencies have been what we've grown up with. You know, we've we've only had this kind of a monetary system, but it's clearly failing. And when it obviously fails in the next iteration of the, uh, you know, the credit booms and busts, uh, I, I think we're going to be discussing a monetary reset that involves some kind of a stabilization mechanism. So uh, that'll be a very different world. But getting from here to there requires some kind of a gigantic crisis. And I think that's the story of the year ahead. Okay. Um, I was kind of smiling in there because I have a, a whole question set for you here that I'm not even sure makes sense if, if we can't even get to that stage because we've had this massive monetary reset <laughs> uh, potentially this soon. Um, I guess first question, John, uh, and I think maybe you've already answered it, but is... Uh, I was going to ask you to compare what you think could happen here to the pain of of the 2008 global financial crisis, uh, but it seems pretty clear from some of the stuff you're talking about that it may feel a hell of a lot worse than 2008 did. Well, yeah, because we were able to bail out the banks last time around because there, there was no real official inflation to speak of, and debt levels were high, but not crazy high. You know, it was possible for the U.S., to toss trillions of dollars at bankrupt financial entities and bail them out. You know, it's not, it's not clear that we have that ability now. So if we can't do that now, then, uh, you know, I, I think that we'll try and we'll fail. And that's, that's what will make the coming crisis so much different from, you know, 2008, 2009. Uh, okay. Wow. Um, all right. Well, look, I, I am going to go in this other territory real quick. Um, because it's not mutually exclusive with with what you see could happen um, uh, on, on the uh, the potential short timeline you just mentioned. Um, but uh, uh, Credit Suisse's uh, Zoltan Pozar uh, came out recently with uh, a really seminal report that that caught a lot of attention. Um, you know, basically saying, "Hey, the the, the you know the, the end of the dollar as the you know, unipolar world currency um, may indeed actually be ending sooner than many people expect. Um, and um, one of the predictions he made is that that oil is going to start trading um, in um, uh, won, um, you know, not as a replacement to the petrodollar, but as a competitor to it. And that this is going to, um, you know, create some pretty big uh, sea changes. Um, and, and that just in general, the world is is shifting from a unipolar dollar denominated model to um, a more bipolar um, world um, and uh, that's going to have competing uh, currencies um, and 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 uh, at, at the core of it is going to be commodities. Um, what commodities trade in, what 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 uh, currencies they trade in, and who gets first uh, priority? on those commodities. And um, let, let me just read a couple of things from the report and then I'll, I'll let you run here. Um, so uh, in many ways, Zoltan was reacting to um, Chinese President Xi, uh, Xi's speech at the um, recent uh, summit of the Arab states, um, where uh, you know he was basically outlining Beijing's plans for outmaneuvering the West in terms of running the global economy. Um, here is a quote from, from President Xi, and then I'll tell you what Posner said. Um, uh, President Xi said, in the next three to five years, China is ready to work with uh, the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, in the following priority areas. First, setting up a new paradigm of all-dimensional energy cooperation, where China will continue to import large quantities of crude oil on a long-term basis from GCC countries and purchase more liquid natural gas. We will strengthen our cooperation in the upstream sector, engineering services, as well as downstream storage, transportation, and refinery. The Shanghai Petroleum and National Gas Exchange Platform will be fully utilized 
uh, for RMB settlement in oil and gas trade, and we could start currency swap cooperation um, and advance uh, the C the MCBDC bridge project. Um, so this is basically you know China saying, look, we're going to make a huge commitment and huge investment to you Gulf states, um, but we want that trade uh, <laughs> monitored or, or conducted uh, in our own currency. Um, the timeline for this was three to five years, um, which uh, uh, Pozar says, um, uh, uh, you know, not only will oil and gas uh, be invoiced not only in dollars, but also in renminbi, um, but in which some oil and gas are not available at low prices uh, or in dollars for the West because they've been encumbered by the East. So kind of the kicker of all this is uh, Pozar says, look, uh, in the emerging multipolar world order, cross-currency bases will be smaller, commodity bases will be greater, and inflation rates in the West will be higher. And he's basically saying the market is not pricing any of this in yet. So uh, I guess I'll take a breath here and let you respond to this. Um, now, this assumes that the whole world monetary order doesn't break, you know, this year. Mm -hmm. um, but if it doesn't, it looks like the order that we have lived with um, is still going to be fracturing in really important ways that could that could be relatively injurious to the, the comfort and the status quo that the West has become accustomed to. Yeah, the the petrodollar is going to get some competition in the year ahead, uh, and and you know part of that is that it, it's it's inevitable that um, other countries as they um, develop are going to be better at things than than they were, uh, but uh, a big part of this is because the U.S. has just totally abused its privilege. I mean, you know, we have the world's reserve currency. And instead of making that a neutral currency that everybody can use without making any kind of a political statement or feeling disadvantaged or whatever, we use it as a weapon. Uh, and rising powers like Russia and China and India are really offended by that. And uh, it, it's logical that they want to build an alternative to the dollar uh, for certain kinds of trade. Uh, and so that, that's probably going to happen. And then, you know, they're also, as I mentioned, buying a lot of gold and silver. And speculation is that um, part of those purchases are to back their currencies to make them better competitors to the dollar. So, right. that's, so, so sorry to interrupt you, but but in this case, let's say China is successful. It launches the Petro Yuan. Um, well, that might be more preferable for the Saudis or other people to take because it's backed in a hard currency like gold. Yes, yeah, it, it, that that might be a consideration. Uh, but the dollar still has incredible advantages in international trade over any other currency. So um, uh, the idea of it losing out completely is probably um, a, a very distant thing. But um, the the idea that it gets some competition in the in the next few years for for bilateral trade bilateral trade between other big countries, uh, that's kind of definitely going to happen, you know, so that that'll be part of the story. And, you know, we'll see what it does in and of itself to the dollar's value, because um, right now, everybody in the world needs to hold dollars for trade and for reserve assets and, and uh, things like that. And, you know, if, if they don't need as many dollars for those things, then it's possible that um, the value of the dollar goes down, other things being equal. In other words, a lot of those dollars will flow back into the U.S., um, buy U.S. assets, push the price of those assets up, which is the same thing as saying push the value of the dollar relative to those assets down. You know, that that could be something that happens. Um, and, you know, that's a geopolitical as well as a financial thing. If we behaved better, um, then it wouldn't be as necessary for these countries to do these things. So, um, yeah, that's that's a real thing. Um, it's going to be part of the story going forward. But I, I think the accumulation of debt at an accelerating rate almost everywhere in the world is, is a much bigger currency story uh, for the dollar and for the other currencies, just because it's, uh, you know, it threatens all of them um, from basically um, hyperinflation down the road if, if we don't get our act together. Okay, so l let's say, John, that 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 this monetary reset that you you, you think is is we're more or less destined for it at, at this point. 
let's say it does happen sooner rather than later. Let's say it's a 2023 event. I'm not I'm not saying you're predicting that, but but let's say that it, it is. Can, can you provide some context around what that would look like and feel like? Well, it, it would probably be preceded by a crisis in which um, the value of the dollar, not versus other currencies necessarily, but versus real stuff, goes down at a disorderly rate. In other words, big price spikes in a lot of important commodities, for instance, or um, um, some financial assets going way up. And, 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 and sorry to interrupt, but would, would, it, would it make like the, the big price increases that we saw coming, you know, through the pandemic, you know, where we saw lumber go crazy and, and eggs at the market go crazy and all that stuff, would it make that look like child's play? It, it could be bigger than that. Yeah. Um, and that, that was pretty scary, but it was, it was very temporary. Everything spiked in June of last year and then has been going down since. So what, if, it, um, if things spike, but there's no real end in sight, then that, that would be the, uh, the kind of the, the precursor to a conversation about how do we fix this? You know, because if we raise interest rates, we bankrupt everybody inside and interest rates are already kind of high. And um, what else can we do? And you'll, you'll hear people and, and, you know, it might be led by China and Russia and India because they're the ones who are so aggressively backing their currencies with real stuff now. So it might be led that by them. It might be led by you know conservatives in the U.S. or whatever. But uh, the, the discussion will start to involve some kind of monetary reset. Uh, now, here's the tricky part with something like that because you can't really announce it ahead of time, right? Because everybody front runs it, right? And uh, and that makes it impossible to do on the terms that you consider favorable if you're the Fed or whatever. Um, so you got to kind of do it by surprise. So it, it's liable to be like a, a Sunday night announcement. Henceforth, the dollar is uh, is just a name for one ten thousandth of an ounce of gold or something like that. You know, and, and if you look back through history, that's the way a lot of devaluations have taken place. You know, they didn't have a big public discussion. They were just the government announcing it one day. And that was that going forward. Um, so, you know, it could end up being something like that, but it'll be preceded by rising monetary chaos. And, and 2022 is kind of a good example of, um, of what we'll see. You know, that was terrifying, eight, eight or nine or 10% inflation and much higher for some of the necessities of life. You know, this, this was a, a potentially destabilizing monetary event in 2022. Well, um, you know, let's, government debt soar and uh, interest rates um, spike and start bankrupting a lot of people. And then the Fed capitulates and pushes interest rates down and that um, accelerates price increases and, and uh, instability in the currency markets, you know, have a year like that. And it, it all of a sudden, some kind of a monetary reset in which you stabilize your currency by linking it to something that doesn't fluctuate, um, or at least doesn't fluctuate a lot. That sounds better than the alternatives, you know? And, and uh, I think for the people in charge, there will be a point where that becomes the case. You know, they, they don't want to be the Herbert Hoovers of their generation, that a hundred years from now, we still know their name because they screwed things up so badly. Um, so they want to head that off. And the only way that they can see to do that is to stabilize their currencies by going back to what humanity has had for, all of its existence prior to 1971, which is a currency, a, a money that is linked to real money, like gold and silver. Uh, so, you know, it's not in any way, in any historical sense, it's not really a radical thing. It just seems radical because we've been living in this kind of fantasy world for the past uh, 50 or 60 years. Right. In well, which, sorry, but it, it, it's been a politician's paradise, right? Where, in other words, oh. you could have been as much money as you wanted, right? So they love being freed from the the control, the constraint that a a, a hard asset backed currency comes with, and of course, that's a feature of it, right? It's supposed to prevent malinvestment and profligacy. But since we went off it, it's been just a party for the, the folks that oh. were central planners, right? Yeah, we have an entire generation of politicians <clears throat> who have never had to say no to a major constituency. You know, they can have whatever military budget they want, at least in the U.S. Um, they can um, let their social programs just run on autopilot to whatever number it takes. And they, so they never have to tell anybody who can threaten them, no, you can't have what you want. 
Um, so this generation of politicians has doesn't have that skill. They have no idea how to prioritize or how to cut. They've never had to do it. Um, but you know, the entire in the entire history of the human race, politicians always had to do that prior to 1971. You know, if you wanted to fight a war, you had to get the gold that you were going to spend on your army. Uh, if you wanted to start a new social program, you ha you actually had to raise taxes on people in order to pay for that social program. Well, that's completely alien to the guys in charge right now. So, you know, it might be one of those generational things where they have to leave before the new mindset, which is actually the very old mindset, um, can return. Because the guys in charge right now just don't have the faintest idea how to do any of the, the stuff that uh, the polish politicians have to do in a real monetary system instead of a fantasy world. This is such an important point, John, and you've actually been making it for years. And, and I do try to mm -hmm. remember to give you credit for that when, when the topic comes up on this program. Um, I can't remember the exact term you used for it, but essentially you were saying, look, the, the folks we have in power just have the wrong musculature for the future that we're going to be going into because they they developed all their expertise and, and muscles you know, in this fantasy period, right? So they they are by def, by you know definition the wrong people to be guiding us through a world that might need to be more constrained and disciplined. Um, and and your your point about you know everything changing in 1971, I always have to reframe myself. And a lot of our viewers are my age or older. Um, I was born in 1971. I was born, I think, two or three weeks before Nixon slammed the gold window. So the only thing I know as my reality is this monetary system that we have right now. And I have to keep reminding myself that, oh yeah, but it's this experiment that started the day I was born. Like if we look back at the rest of the arc of history, it, nothing like that really existed before, right? So um, we, we have to, you know, I, understandably, we kind of go with what we know, right? We just have to remind ourselves that what we know is actually a big historical aberration. Yeah, it's an, it's an experiment that failed, but it took a really long time to fail. Um, it took such a long time to fail that it convinced an awful lot of people that it succeeded. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, it, it is in the process of failing now. That's what's so interesting about this time. I mean, this was the biggest monetary experiment in the history of the human race. We've had smaller ones like um, uh, John Law and uh, the uh, U.S. Continental and uh, right. Weimar Germany, things that, uh, that started and failed almost immediately. Well, th this, because it was global, um, existed for a really long time, but, uh, but but it can't go on much longer. We're, we're seeing signs of its ending now. But yeah, um, if you're a money manager, for instance, especially one your age, you only know by the dip. That is the only environment you've ever lived in. So when when a bad thing happens and stocks go down, you you buy them. You try to call the bottom, and you you just load up the truck because you know the central banks are going to come in and bail you out. That's all you know, and um, and that's crazy. But it is the reality of the entire generation of today's money managers who are who are less than like seventy years old, um, and um, that's why the financial markets behave so strangely now because their reality is that. Um, the, the world's central banks, the monetary authorities have their backs. You know, they, they're going to take care of the financial system no matter what. And uh, when that doesn't happen, you know, when, when that fails, just like we have a generation of politicians who are completely unsuited for the coming world, we have a generation of money managers and financial planners um, who are in basically the same boat. They don't have the slightest idea how to deal with a world where money supply is limited. And it's not going to grow 10% to take care of this crisis. It's going to grow 1% or 2%, no matter what else is going on in the world, you know? And that's uh, that's going to lead to a lot of very unhappy clients, I think, out there. Yeah. Well, that's what I found so fascinating in 2022 was the market was so used to the Fed having its back and coming to the rescue that it, it, it kept every time Powell would open his mouth or, or the Fed would release a statement, <clears throat> the market would jump. 
because it would say, oh, okay, well, then he's about to pivot, right? And then Powell would have to come back on and say, no, 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 you guys aren't getting my message here. Like, I'm super serious <laughs> about being committed to doing whatever <laughs> it takes to get inflation under control. And the market just couldn't get through its mind that Powell had actually sort of changed his behavior. Well, yeah, basically, since the 1990s, the Fed's job has been to elevate asset prices. So, you know, it's reasonable as a money manager to expect that because it's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. When there's trouble, they come in and they push stock prices back up because the government had, had decided to use equity prices as their fiscal management lever. In other words, you, you pump a bunch of money into equities, stock prices go up, people feel richer, they spend more money, and the economy grows. And that was how the government managed the economy. Um, that is not the right way to do it <laughs> at all. But uh, um, that's what an entire generation of money managers and politicians concluded was reality. That's just how we manage things. So yeah, so when it stops, uh, they're going to be baffled. It's, it's Twitter is going to be hilarious. If um, it, it, you want to follow a lot of money managers just to watch their bafflement and uh, in real time, you know, because they're not going to know what's happening. And and you're right. If if Powell actually chooses to raise interest rates to let's say five and a half or six percent on the, the short end, um, the, it will be met with total incredulity by the money management community. They will not believe that's even possible. Um, and it'll take them a long time to panic. But the you know once they find out that their world is not their world anymore. Um, then they're not going to know what to do. So they'll probably, a lot of them will just go to all cash. They'll sell everything in sight and, uh, and just totally retreat. And then they'll be fired and then they'll get other jobs, you know, but uh, that, that's going to be the process. Uh, again, another reason that, that what's coming is going to be absolutely fascinating, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, so much you're talking about is, and it, it comports with, you know, Neil <clears throat> Howe's fourth turning and whatnot. It, it's the ending of a, a, a status quo, the ending of a certain order, to be replaced uh, by a new one. And folks, um, if you haven't yet watched um, the interview that I did with Neil Howe, we just reran it uh, over the holidays. Um, go watch that after this video. I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, all right, John, look, I, I had a, a whole section I was going to go through with you about sort of the coming recession. And you, you mentioned in your initial answer that you felt one was pretty much baked in the cake for next year, uh, or sorry, this year, now that we're in 2023. Um, I, I'm going to skip over that just for time's sake here. We'll have to get you back on the program again soon to dive more deeply into that and some of the other questions I'm just going to have to jettison here. But but let's now go to your market outlook here. I think you gave us a little bit of a preview, but you know, you're know you basically saying, look, uh, the standard money managers are going to be really disappointed, likely, uh, as we continue to go forward in this year, just like they were in 2022. Um, and... Uh, I'll let you provide the details here, but it sounds like you're saying, you know, the the message from the universe at this point in time is to really start transitioning from paper assets into ones that are more tangibly backed. So um, what is your general market outlook for this year? You know, do you see a new low for the bear market, something else, a Fed pivot? Um, and uh, what guidance would you have, if any, for today's investor trying to figure out how to navigate all this? Well, here's a plausible scenario. Um, Interest rates continue to go up for a while and stocks continue to go down because they, they can't really go up in the face of rising interest rates, especially interest rates at today's levels. Um, so that happens for a while. And then the Fed announces that it's not raising interest rates anymore. It's going to pause. Mm -hmm. Stocks initially go up. They, they have a, um, a relief rally. But then everyone starts thinking, OK, but at this level of interest rates, um, this is going to go wrong, and this is going to go wrong, and this is going to break, you know. So we we can't right. function with interest rates stable at this level. And then stocks go back down and they go down hard. Um, and that causes the Fed to really pivot. In, in other words, to go from stability and general tightness to easing and easing aggressively, you know. And so, so you've got a period where uh stocks are tanking and the Fed is easing, but stocks don't buy it anymore and they go down even further. Um, to some really, what seems like, um, by today's standards, extremely low level. And then the Fed really panics. A and then we get, you know, the potential instability, the potential crack up boom. But I, I think the first half of this year is probably not good for risk assets, just because we have to get to the point where rates can be cut. And the only way we can get there um, with today's Federal Reserve's attitude 
um, is for the financial markets to be in crisis. So we kind of need that crisis. The Fed has right. to break it, something. It, and sorry, yeah. but also for economic demand to, to fall enough to really yes. bring inflation down. Yeah, yeah. You have to have the, the wealth effect work in reverse dramatically before the Fed will feel comfortable or feel compelled to really start easing again. Um, you know, things like that can happen quickly. You, you could have all of the stuff I just said happen by June, just because when stocks tank, they can really tank. You know, you can get a 20% um, a, a drop in stock prices in a couple of months if everybody starts to panic. And, and that might, might be enough to do it from here, because we've already had the 20% drop. We've already wiped out close to $20 trillion of financial wealth. Um, let's do that again and then see what the Fed thinks about all of that. So, yeah, and, and sorry, sorry to interrupt, but just to, to add on to that, um, sort of longtime money managers uh, like um, uh, uh, Ted Oakley, who I've had in the program, says it's it's very common in a bear market washout for that last 25% to go very quickly at the end in the way that you're describing. Yeah, you know, and I always miss that. In previous bear markets, I'll, I'll short things. And then take profits and take profits, and I'll be I'll be completely out of shorting before that last waterfall collapse happens. You know, it's very frustrating because yeah, it's it's hard to hold on if you're a short when things start looking really cheap relative to the last few years. You know, but that's that's when if you're a brave short seller, you make your real money in that last capitulation. So maybe this time around, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, but you know, shorting is not a bad thing to be looking at right now. So you can do that with put options. You know, two two year out put options on big liquid things like the, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 or Google or something like that, uh, or Amazon. Um, those are things you can probably short in this environment and be okay with. And uh, otherwise you wanna be super risk averse. And that might mean even, I know, I know this sounds kind of out of character, but long-term treasuries at some point are gonna attract a lot of capital when the stock market really starts tanking. So that might be something, you know, or, or you know, intermediate term government paper. Those, those are places where you can hide out. And obviously gold and silver, although they, they might get sucked down with equities in general, but it'll be a V bottom. You know, if you can uh, kind of come close to calling the, the bottom in gold and silver as stocks are falling, uh, you'll, you'll get to ride them up, uh, you know, doubling for gold and quadrupling for silver. Uh, and then the equities that are related to precious metals are, are they're interesting today, you know, and I, I think that um, they'll also suffer in an equities bear market, but not nearly as badly as a lot of financial assets do. And uh, and what, when it comes time for the turn, they will be the uh, the shining stars of the stock market. So gold and silver miners, probably uranium miners for reasons that we don't have time to get into, but nuclear is probably coming back in style. That's good for uranium and maybe energy equities. So the, those four categories, gold, silver, uranium, and oil, let's say, uh, are probably a, a place where you're gonna find a lot of five baggers and maybe 10 baggers, you know? So they'll, they'll be um, big winners when that big turn finally comes. All right, thanks. And, and for folks that wanna hear the more detailed story on uranium, um, I did an interview a few months ago with Justin Hune, uh, the publisher of Uranium Insider. We went really deep into that topic. So that's another video you can go watch afterwards. I'll put up a link to that one here right now. Um, all right, John, um, look, you, uh, you you just gave a, a fantastic um, you had a checklist of, of all the assets I was going <laughs> to ask you about. <laughs> um, I'm glad you mentioned bonds, um, particularly uh, U.S. sovereign bonds. We've had a lot of discussion on this channel that I, so I, I don't need to go uh, rehash it all. But a number of folks I've been talking to have been saying that they think that this is one of the best environments uh, right now to be getting exposure to those uh, those long bond or those bonds and particularly the longer end of the bond uh, duration spectrum because um, a, a, you know when they're finally paying you something right you know they weren't paying you much at all in the past couple of years now you're actually getting paid a somewhat decent return that's getting better as as the inflation rates coming down on a, on a real basis. Um, and uh, so you can get paid to wait and it's a risk-free product. Uh, but if we get this you know, progression that you're talking about, um, then interest rates could come down a fair amount and, and bond prices, particularly on the, on the 
farther end of the duration spectrum could really increase pretty dramatically. So you don't get this kind of risk reward, uh, you know, upside, uh, you know, very often in this type of instrument. So especially with the, the, the safety that's packaged around it. So anyways, glad you talked about that. Um, gold sober. Um, I, I assume when you think of gold and silver making sort of a V bottom um, in, in sort of a, you know, a bearish capitulation, are they going down primarily because of uh, margin calls and stuff like that? They're just collateral that can be sold, or is there another reason that they would, the metals themselves would be going down? Well, I, I think people just get scared during equities bear markets, and like you said, they they tend to sell what they can sell. You know, if gold and silver aren't down, then that's what you sell for your margin calls on your uh, your, your Google stock or something like that. So they they just tend to get sucked down along with everything else. And we saw that in 2008 and we saw it, saw it in 2020. But in both cases, those bottoms were phenomenal entry points. You know, they just took off after that. So I, I, I think this will be that again, but on steroids, because central banks will be absolutely panicking. And the rest of the, the market will understand that there's a reason for central banks to be panicking. Um, and they'll, they'll pile into these, what are basically small illiquid markets and have a lot of difficulty getting through that door, you know? So I, I think that um, there will be a stretch where you just flat out can't buy silver eagle coins, you know? And uh, you'll you'll have to pay what seem like insane amounts of money to get them when they are available. Um, so, you know, it's a timing thing with precious metals. You could just load up right now and just ride this whole thing out and know you're going to make a lot of money in the long run. Or you could... Um, Keep some powder dry and, and look for that bottom. I, I, you know, either one of them are defensible strategies. Right. Or you could just dollar cost average too, right? But yeah, you could do that, which you should have been doing all along. Just keep on dollar cost averaging, you know, and uh, and it's going to work out for you in the end if you do that. So yeah, there, there's there are very few wrong ways to approach asset classes that are going to be that far back in style when the time comes, you know, because uh, no no prices that are prevailing now. Are going to look expensive uh, compared to where we end up with three or five years from now, especially in precious metals, but also uranium and oil. You know, and um, that it's nice to have that kind of a wind at your back, so it papers over your timing mistakes. Very well put. All right, John. Well, look, I'm going to have to wrap things up here um, real quick. I had a number of other topics. Um, one, we were going to really delve into sort of insurance for a moment to emphasize the point you made about a half hour back about how, given uh, the high level of uncertainty of the year that we're going into, um, it really is a year for, um, you know, hedging and getting insurance in your portfolio and just making sure that, you know, first and foremost, you minimize your ability to absorb losses because the type of future we're going into is one where, you know, if you can just manage not to lose, or at least to lose a lot less than everybody else on a relative basis, you're going to come out far better. Um, but um, we'll have you back on in the future to dive a little bit more deeply into that. As we wrap up, one question for you, because I believe you've been public about this, and if not, we'll edit it from, from the video here. But um, I know that you had put some shorts on Tesla that you've been riding for a while and had been painful as Tesla continued just to power higher. But now Tesla has lost like 70% of its value. Uh, over the past year. I, I hope you've held on to them and they're paying off for you now. <laughs> so when you're shorting, especially with options, timing is everything, Adam. And, and as, as anybody who does it finds out really quickly. So yeah, I was short Tesla for two years with some long dated put options. And um, towards the end of last year, uh, the, the options started to run out. I had to bail. I had to, to get rid uh, of those options. And uh, so, so I got out before the real decline in Tesla happened. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's a, a lesson learned and, and a lot of money left on the table there. If I just rolled those put options over into something further out in the future. But, you know, the problem with shorting something like Tesla with options is that the option premiums are outrageous. So many other people are trying to do it <clears throat> that you have to pay way up to be able to short a stock like that. And which means it has to fall a really long way before you're even breaking even again. Um, so, yeah, missed opportunity, but only a small missed opportunity because I wouldn't have been able to make that much by using puts because the premiums were so high. We're so, so high. Yeah. All right. 
And, and I, I, so I'm sorry that you missed the big opportunity. Um, <laughs> look, you got a lot of company. I, I had been shorting uh, the Fang Complex for I think all of 2019, <laughs> um, and uh, and and now to see that it, it finally took until 2022 for it all to come down. I mean, had it had been positioned there, you know, three years later, it would have made a killing. Um, so it does hurt when your thesis is right. It's just right after you've had to limp out of the game here. But it's instructive for people that, um, you know, people get really, uh, people with a bearish sentiment uh, can get really excited about, okay, well, when the market really, you know, is going to crack, then I'm going to really short it on the way down. Shorting is really tough. I'm not saying not to do it, but I'm saying in general, do it sort of like with the money you can afford to lose. Because as John just said, timing is everything. And usually it's not a slow grind down for most uh, securities. Usually uh, their their reckoning happens a lot faster than their march upward did. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is sort of my way of just underscoring my previous point, which is the type of future we're coming into from an odds and a risk reward standpoint, you're much better off on just minimizing losses and, you know, yes, putting in some prudent, um, uh, you know, growth opportunities but 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 it, it's not a time to be betting the farm <laughs> certainly not a time to be betting farm on the long side as john has really made out here but i would say even on the short side unless you've got a ton of experience in this which which honestly very few investors do if you're going to short largely kind of dabble with it or at least use money that you can afford to lose because it can be so hard even for the guys who have a very long track record like john which he just just shared with us yeah and, and you know the problem is that uh, we've been trained to look at the long side, you know, buy things that'll go up. And it's it's really hard to shift to the other direction and, and start betting on things going down. You know, there, there is money to be made in shorting, especially in bubble markets like this, but um, but it's psychologically hard. And, um, you know, it, it's it's been a really hard thing to do in general because the Fed for the longest time was on the other side of that. It's debt. fighting you, yeah, exactly. You're yeah. fighting the every yeah. institution. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and so we may be um, at a point where the Fed is on our side now as short sellers. Uh, but you're you're right. It's just, um, it, you know, it's it's a harder risk to take psychologically than going wrong. So, yeah, you know, it's it, it works. Watch the movie The Big Short and, and you see how uh, it's painful. It's scary. But if it works, it's life changing money. Right, so I, right. I think everybody should have some shorts. You know, I think you should just be looking at things you think. See, if you look at something and think, I don't want to buy that. It's too expensive. Your next um, thought should be, well, maybe I should short it, you know, instead of just leaving it, bet against it. But you should, like you said, you shouldn't do it as your primary form of investing. Just do it as something that's that's fun and potentially another kind of income stream with your investing. Yeah, and, and that's a great segue just in my my normal closing shtick here, which is, um, you know, reiterate again, I think the top priority going forward into a year like the one that looks to be ahead of us is, is risk management, which is, you know, providing lots of ways to protect against downside risk in your portfolio through smart strategies like hedging, etc., um, but uh, shorting can be a, a, a important part of that, but it's one of those things, sort of like options, where if you don't have experience with it, you really just shouldn't be picking it up cold turkey and putting you know substantial amounts of your wealth in there. Highly recommend that you work with a professional financial advisor who is experienced in these instruments, whether it's options, whether it's shorts or whatnot, and can help you determine what makes sense given your goals, given your level of risk tolerance, given what kind of loss you could absorb given your long-term plans for your portfolio and, and coming up with a smart plan for it. And, and you're drafting off of their expertise, right? They're actually placing the trades for you, explaining them to you why they're doing what they're doing. And then as you get experience uh, going through that process, well, then maybe you can start you know, doing some on your own. Uh, but anyways, uh, highly recommend that you work with a professional financial advisor who understands both that as well as all the macro uh, trends that John and I have discussed in this video. If you've already got a great one that does that, phenomenal. Stick with them. But if you don't or you'd like a second opinion from one who does, just talk to one of the financial advisors that's endorsed by Wealthion. Totally free no commitment to work with them. It's just a public service they offer to make people more informed so they can make better decisions in this very challenging environment. To go set up one of those consultations, just go to Wealthion. 
www.thinkingdeeply.com. Fill out the short form there. Uh, John, it's been wonderful. Folks, if you've really enjoyed this, this nice conversation with John, where he gave us so much of his time and expertise, and would like to see John come back on the channel again, uh, please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon <laughs> right next to it. Um, John, again, can't thank you enough, buddy. Really look forward to having you back on the channel again. And I really wish you and your family the best of 2023s. Thanks, Adam. You too. Hey, I've got something I can, I, I'd like to plug. Plug away. If, if we've got a second. Uh, yeah, I'm Absolutely. setting up a Substack, Substack feed, which is basically a, a newsletter um, where I'm going to focus on actionable ideas. In other words, which gold stock should be, you be buying today? What do you think of this junior miner? What do you think of this uranium stock? Um, and, and um, you know, it's it's not quite set up yet. I think you can go there and I think you can sub sub subscribe, but I haven't published anything there yet. But um, I, I'm ready to start publicizing it. And uh, it's at uh, rubino.substack.com. And uh, there, there's a way to subscribe just to get what I'm doing for free to begin with. And then later on, there'll be a paywall and a subscription fee. But uh, for now, everything's going to be free. And, um, you know, look forward to seeing you there. Well, that's great. Uh, so, folks, uh, I'm so happy to hear that because I've been talking with John for the better part of a year or two um, about the potential for him to, to create his own substack. You, If you've known John, you, you probably know him from being the founder of Dollar Collapse dot com, um, which John uh, has now uh, handed over to another group to run. Um, and uh, he's trying to enjoy his semi-retirement. Um, but uh, he, both he and I know that that uh, he's too involved in the game to stay out. And so we've been um, he's been telling me his thoughts about starting a substack. And I'm so glad, John, that one is finally up. We will definitely put that URL up on the screen. And folks, highly recommend you go get that, particularly why it's still free. And I'll tell you, you know, I'll share personally that John is one of the fellows that I talk to when I consider uh, some of these, you know, resource sectors. So definitely gold miners, silver miners, uh, uranium miners. Um, John's one of the first guys I call on my list when I'm thinking about a company and asking his opinion. So highly experienced investor in this space. Uh, this is a great opportunity. And John, I'm so happy for you that you're finally doing this. Thanks, Adam. All right, everybody else. Thanks so much for hanging with us for this long, uh, but hopefully very detailed and very enjoyable discussion with John. Uh, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time.